Hi everyone, and welcome back to Retro 48K for the third in my technically correct series. Now this time we're moving on to the 32-bit era, and we're going to have a look at the Sega Saturn and see how that one worked. And this is a video that it's been it's been a while since I've done one of these, and that's because I was kind of loath to start this one. I knew I wanted to cover the Saturn. It's such a unique and different machine, and I was really looking forward to digging under the hood of it. But at the same time, the 32-bit machines are far more complex than the 16-bit counterparts, and it was just a bit of a daunting task to start. But anyway. I think I've figured it out now how we can move forward with this, so similar to last time I'm going to talk about the architecture of the system and a bit about how it draws and renders its graphics, but mainly I'm going to explore some of the myths around the Saturn and try and expose them for being either true or false. So let's start at the beginning and let's have a look at its architecture. So from a high level, the Saturn is actually fairly similar to the Mega Drive. It has three component, major components in terms of the CPU, the sound and the video system but unlike the Mega Drive each of these can be thought of as a system in its own right they're that complicated and each one of them is probably more complicated than the Mega Drive was in total plus added on to that you've also got a CD-ROM subsystem and then sitting in the middle of it all you've got the system control unit and it all links together with this bus. Now, for those of you who aren't computer science specialists a bus is basically a pipeline that all the information has to travel down and so that's the basic overarching architecture but let's take a look at each one in general and try and expose some of the myths and misnomers about the Saturn. So let's start with the CPU. So the CPU subsystem is actually made up of quite a few components. You have two SH2 CPUs running at 28 megahertz each, 1.5 megabytes of work RAM and something called the SMPC which was basically your interface to your peripherals, so your joy pads, your steering wheels, things like that. And connecting all this was a 32-bit 28 megahertz bus. Now this is where it's worthwhile discussing one of the first myths of the Saturn in terms of it being underpowered. It wasn't underpowered. The PlayStation had a central CPU that was 33 megahertz. The Saturn had two 28 megahertz CPUs. So even the worst programmer you would think should be able to make up the difference of that five megahertz between the two CPUs. But like all things with the Saturn, it wasn't as simple as that. The, because the bus or pipeline between the RAM and the rest of the system and the CPUs was only 32 bits wide, the same as the the CPU, each CPU. It meant that only one CPU could access RAM at a time, or basically access that pipeline, so you had to wait for the other to finish its work for you to start. Now Sega tried to negate this somewhat by putting cache on each CPU, which is fairly common these days, so that you could take something out of RAM or out of wherever and put it in that cache, work on it and then send it back. And this worked quite well, but it did mean that it wasn't as straightforward as you would have expected. So while the myth isn't true about the Saturn being underpowered, it was more complicated to get access to that power. And the SMPC sounds like a good idea in terms of, it had two modes on it. It had an active mode and a passive mode. One would queue up commands from the controller. So when you the game's code was ready to read the next user input, it would just go to that SMPC, pull the next line, uh, the next user input off and deal with that one. Straightforward enough. But if you wanted it to be a bit more intuitive, you had to write your own code and send it to that system. And that's another theme of the Saturn. If you wanted it to do something out of the norm, you had to do it yourself. There was no cheats there. Sega did have some libraries in this, but not a huge amount. So you were relying on your own coding skills a lot of the time. Next up, let's have a look at the video subsystem. So the Saturn had two VDPs, which were video display processors. It had two of these working in tandem, VDP1 and VDP2. Both had access to their own 512 kilobytes of RAM, and there was two frame buffers, each with 256 kilobytes. Now, it was all designed for the Saturn to work, for these two processes to work independently of each other. VDP1 would focus on polygons and sprites, while VDP2 would focus on backgrounds of up to five layers. 
uh, within each with independent scrolling and vertical scrolling. Uh, you can think of VDP2 really as an evolution of the super scalar technology behind titles like Outrun in the arcades. So you've got really large playing backgrounds that you could scroll and rotate. It was really impressive stuff. And um, VDP1 was kind of the I need to work in 3D or I need to chuck a lot of sprites around the screen type one. And the way they could work independent was VDP1 could be processing something in frame buffer 1, while in frame buffer 2, the VDP2 could be adding backgrounds to that frame and then spitting it out. So you could be almost working on two frames at the same time to build that image. And again, this was all synced to in ideal terms at 60 frames per second but obviously based on the calculations you were sending it you might not be able to send the information to these at 60 frames per second so the output might only be 20 or 30 depending on the game and next up let's talk about the sound subsystem and the cd-rom one seeing as how they're a bit interconnected so the sound subsystem had its own cpu and its own 512 kilobytes of ram it also had its own separate DSP, which is Digital, Sig Digital Signal Processor, and basically, I'm not an audio file, so I can't go into too much detail here because I'd be telling you stuff I didn't really understand. But the basic outcome of it is, it had up to 32 sound channels. It could use uh, process both samples like the Super Nintendo did, or direct FM modulation like the Mega Drive did. So it had the best of both worlds in that sense, and you'd expect this from a system that had the ability to read from CD quality audio. And speaking from CDs, the CD subsystem was far more complicated than you would expect. Again, it had its own CPU, this time an SH1. It had its own RAM, again 512 kilobytes. It had its own ROM, which was basically the CD. And uh, you could plug in an MPEG decoder as well for some additional work there. And basically the reason they did all this with the CD drive was to try and speed up loading times so you could use that RAM to pre-read things off the CD title sequences things like that that you what you knew you would have to fast load and you wanted a better user experience you could use that additional RAM to have that ready to send to the CPUs or whatever and the other benefit of it was it made it really hard to crack the Saturn um, Yes, CDs could be cracked, but actually getting the information from the CD to the CPU was only bypassed a couple of years back. It's taken people 20 years to figure out a way of bypassing this chip because of, of its complexities. It, if you look at the Saturn, at the Dreamcast, for example, or the GameCube, people have put mods in there where you can read off SD cards and things. Until recently, that just wasn't possible with the Saturn because of this architecture. And finally, sitting in the middle of all this tangled web, was the system control unit which had a bus controller that basically controlled all these different pipelines talking to things 32-bit from the cpus and 16-bit from the other ones all running at 28 megahertz to sync everything up together and then you had another dsp in here now this was a clever bit of kit um, basically what it did was it had some specially designed maths multipliers and things like that in there so developers could send complex geometry calculations to it have it done in that on the way to the graphics card which sounds really good in theory however one of the other myths around the Saturn is that it was hard to program for now this is both true and not true so Sega actually provided a bunch of libraries for doing things on this DSP uh, which a lot of people used but the difference between this one and say the PlayStation was that the PlayStation had a special geometry core in the CPU itself so you could do all your calculations in one place before you sent them on. Here you had to send specific programs to the DSP to get the calculations and if you wanted to do a calculation and then do something with it you had to send it back to the CPU and then back to memory so it wasn't it sounded like a good idea in theory but I think in practice it just wasn't as good as having it in all in one place in the core and I think that was one of the advantages as a PlayStation because a lot of people say oh it was difficult to code and all this stuff well both the Saturn and PlayStation used risk based CPUs so you could write the code in C it would do some pipelining and optimization for you for those two CPUs but not a lot and you could you know just compile it for the two different systems the problem was is that obviously the Saturn being so complicated all these additional features and benefits of all this additional hardware wouldn't really be realized in that 
code because the compiler just wouldn't do it. So to get the best out of it, you had to write in assembly language, which is basically writing for the bare metal. It'll only work on this system and it's designed specifically for this system. And so while it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was harder to program for, it, you had to know the system inside how you had to be a specialist in it. So I, I would say a better way of phrasing that one bit would be, it was more effort to program for well. Uh, you could get better results faster on the PlayStation, I think would be a better way of putting that one. So that's the Saturn's general architecture, and I hope I haven't lost you so far. But how does it actually produce those visuals? Well, as I said, VDP2 is basically producing scrolling background layers that can scale and rotate sprites and, you know, think mode 7 but on multiple layers. So that's fairly straightforward. You've seen that before on other videos. VDP1 is the interesting one. So this is what is doing polygons, or as Saturn calls them, parts. Now, the Saturn didn't do polygons like any other system. The Saturn drew quads, which is four corners. And as you can see from this wireframe I'm showing now of Daytona, it had its advantages. So the Saturn would draw quads and then you could color them or you could texture them. Now this had a lot of advantages in the fact that you needed less to draw large flat planes. You know, you just do one big square, you can cover larger areas of that rather than two triangles. And it, a lot of ships are built as squares and you could still do triangles. You just had to make sure, you know, if, if your square had points A, B, C and D, then to draw a triangle, you just make points C and D be the same point, and one side would be zero length, and there you've got your triangle. This did have some major drawbacks, however, and one of them is around one of the myths about the Saturn that it couldn't do transparency. So I'll get onto that in a second, but what are the other drawbacks? Well, it did mean that if you were putting flat square pe uh, textures on, the Saturn would basically have this wireframe mesh that I'm still showing now. Uh, this is Virtual Fighter, and it would map the textures to to that mesh. So developers had to you know calculate loads of different angles for textures and things like that to get them to show. But what it also sh meant was that if you had a texture uh, that was applying to a quad that you turned into a triangle, you had to adjust that texture because obviously you were the texture was mapped to four points of the square. So when you made two of the points come together. You couldn't just take a square texture and apply it to that, you had to morph it into a triangular one and change the entire texture to get it to fit properly. So if you were dealing with triangles, which everyone else was, it did mean it was a pain to rewrite your textures. The other thing is that the textures were attached to all four points. So if you were to do something like the PlayStation's Gran Turismo, for example, where you had uh, reflections moving across a surface, you couldn't do that on the Saturn because you couldn't move the text. The, the PlayStation wasn't fixed to any f particular points. You could move it across the surface. The Saturn, it was on those four points. However, if you look at Sonic R's loading screen, you'll see the shine on that reflection moves. And that's because they wrote it purely in software in C, so you could get around the hardware limitations. However, C code had about... Um, Developers reckoned it was about five times slower than writing it in assembly code on the hardware, so you did have some limitations there. And finally, the myth about the transparency. So, if you had a square shape and a quad, perfect. Saturn could do transparency. You'll see here on Burning Rangers, there's plenty of transparency on this screen. I'll zoom in on this bit. You can see it's there, not a problem. Where the problem was, and why most developers would do what the wipeout devs did where they used the hashed effect of one square coloured one square not as you can see here the reason they did that was because if you were turning your quad into a triangle or you weren't drawing it exactly as a square then because the Saturn was still drawing a square it didn't know that points two points were in the same place so it would still just draw the square line by line across as if it was which meant that again similar with the textures when you squashed them down the transparency when you squashed it down meant you didn't get an even transparency effect you got an odd effect and that would then look odd when you combined it with all the other shapes so you couldn't get an, a fluid transparency and the hashed actually looked better in those instances so I can understand why developers would choose to do that but it didn't mean the Saturn wasn't capable of doing it it was just a complicated hardware trick <laughs> 
So that's kind of it. That's the general overview of the Saturn. Hopefully I've gone into it in enough detail for you. And hopefully I've covered how what an interesting and unique console this is to make. It really is sort of the last of the... It, the 32 bit era, I think, is the last of the consoles that had a lot of soul to them. You, you look at a Saturn game and you know it's a Saturn game, much like other consoles, you know, Amiga and Mega Drive games. You just have to hear them and you know that's a Mega Drive, that's an Amiga. Uh, the colour palette on the Super Nintendo was so unique, and that's what I love about sort of 80s and 90s hardware. They were all unique and that each machine had a soul to it that you don't tend to see nowadays, as they're all just carbon copies of the same architecture. And I hope it's highlighted some of the complexities of coding for the Saturn and how when things were designed and built for it, it really showed off what it could do. That VDP2 chip, for example, meant that the Saturn could do massive flat planes really well, whereas the PlayStation would have had to make that up from huge amounts of polygons, which means that games like Panzer Dragoon and whatnot would have been incredibly difficult to do on the PlayStation, but the Saturn just spat them out like it was no problem. And some levels in Panzer Dragoon look absolutely gorgeous with the rippling water effects and things like that. It just looks phenomenal. And, of course, the Saturn was a 2D powerhouse. That fact that it could have up to five background layers of any sort of colour density and things like that, that's one thing I didn't cover is colours go nuts. The, the, the colour limitations of the 60 bit era were kind of out the window with 32 bit. It was, there were some limitations, but it's all down to the number of permutations, number of backgrounds, number of sprites, and it just becomes meaningless really to talk about in a short video like this. And, but you had, because the, polygon pushing nature of the Saturn was all basically scaled sprites. It meant that it was an absolute monster at doing stuff like this and games like Guardian and Heroes and pretty much every 2D shooter on there really just showed off what it could do. Even ones like Macross with planes, just no problem for the Saturn. It could do that easy with a couple of different background layers. So that brings me to the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I just want to quote some of my sources. So. A big thank you to, I believe it is Sega Retro.org. These guys archive all the old developers' manuals and things that I use for a lot of these videos. So, big thank you to them, and just for you know, just for keeping this stuff for prosperity and, and making sure it's not lost because it is interesting. And the other th big thank you is a YouTube channel called Gamer Hut. Now. This is a guy who worked for Traveller's Tales. He developed a lot of old Mega Drive games like Sonic 3D and he worked on Sonic R. And some of his videos on some of the coding tricks he used on the Saturn for Sonic R are just brilliant and really give you an in-depth knowledge of the hardware. So go check out his videos. A lot of my comments here on the code instructor uh, on the, you know, the, well, the Sonic R example I used is all from his channel. So please go and check that one out. Um, I'm not trying to claim his work, but he, ha he has influenced me a lot in my understanding of the Saturn. I'm trying to explain it here. And to be honest, he probably does a better job. So that's it. That brings me to the end. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Uh, the only last thing to say is, did I get everything right? If you know of any issues or I've mis-explained something or you want to know more or you think I've got something wrong, please put it in the comments. I'd love to hear back um, and I'll pin anything that is a genuine correction that I need to do. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you could hit that like and subscribe and all that stuff, then please do. And I'm Retro48K and I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Should be links and stuff on the screen right now for more videos. Check them out. And if you haven't done so, hit that like and subscribe button. See you next time.